I want to have the freedom to actually do real work, like get my hands dirty, go back to my roots. And that's what I did. I created with Rose Vision. So, and I saw the clients going through the same the small businesses to the same stages of change that my parents went through. And yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. You got to experience as a child digital transformation, but we didn't call yes. it digital transformation back then. And your parents adjusted, I thought it was brilliant. They adjusted in the first wave um, from manual to electric typewriters. But when the next okay. wave came, they couldn't adjust anymore. It was too, the barriers were too high, a cost yes. or change, whatever it was. So you got to experience that as a kid and now you've used that in your whole life. That, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty cool story. Welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. This is Darren Pulsford, Chief Solution Architect, author, and most importantly, your host. On today's episode, Effective Organizational Change, with special guest Dr. Madeline Wallace, author of best-selling book, The Seam Framework. Madeline, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hey, um, I, I was fascinated to, I, I read a little bit in your book and I was fascinated with your approach on things. Uh, today we're talking about change management. We're talking about organizational change. We're talking about digital transformation in, in culture. But before we get there, Madeline, my audience loves to hear people's background story. So give it to us, Madeline. Where do you come from? What <clears throat> What led you to where writing a book about uh, change. So um, I'm Madeline Wallace, and I am from Peru. Um, I was born in a little town in the coast of Peru, and the name of the town is Moyendo. And I came to the United States to pursue my education. So I did my undergraduate, then my master, and then my PhD in sociology uh, with a concentration in demography uh, and also statistics. So why I decided to write the book, um, it basically goes back to my childhood um, that my father and mother, they had a vocational school in Peru, in Moyendo. So my parents used to travel from Moyendo all the way to Lima Back then was like a 24 hour trip and they will go and get information and study and then they will bring all the knowledge to Moyendo and they will teach typing, shorthand, um, business administration, uh, bookkeeping and um, to be for the, uh, basically they were teaching the new professionals to be secretaries or to help accounting people. So that, that was basically the school. So they bought you know, they have typewriters and then they bought electric typewriters and they thought that that's it, that they were, you know, that they were ahead of their time for the small town. But guess what? The 80s computers came and um, this is very sad because I experienced that change. My parents couldn't adapt. They couldn't transform and they had to close the school and we had to move to another city. So this was a tremendous change. And in addition to that, was that my father um, and my mother, back then they didn't have the resources of uh, to be able to buy all the computers and also change their model, their business model. Right. And the government, the government started offering free classes for computers so in the small towns. So there was no option. And and they moved, and when they moved, they... they um, became um, employees of another vocational schools that were bigger. And so it, it was different, but they always have this thing about teaching and about sharing information. So in the weekends, my parents will transport the house that we were living at Equipa and it will become school, remedial school for people who are in high school or anybody who, who was taking classes, but they were behind. So my parents, they will do the remedial school. So they were really committed to that. And when I saw the transition, it was also my personal transition from a small town to a big city, from my parents being employers to employees. And then it's different culture. 
Arequipa is more conservative, it's a bigger city, it's called the White City. It's a colonial, conservative in the mountains. And Moyendo is a, a small beach town. So people are more relaxed. And then, you know, I, so that really changed. And then um, when I came to the United States, you know, it was a cultural shock, but I came because I wanted my education. But this is it. I worked for, uh, I got my PhD, and my dream was like, yes, I'm going to be in academia, whatever. But, you know, you fall in love. I decided to go ahead and go to a small town in Louisiana, and my life completely changed. So basically, then is when I actually learned how to apply all the theory to the real world in Louisiana. So I always very thankful of my time in Louisiana. And why did I say that? Because I saw the change, but also I became what? An entrepreneur. I, I had my first business. I started giving lectures. Then I got a job and I was teaching about performance majors, about strategic planning. And then I thought, hey, you know, I need to go ahead and go to a bigger city. So I came to Washington, D.C. I started working for large companies that do contracts with the federal government. Then from the federal government, you know, I saw, hey, who is the one who can solve all the problems that gives the money? <laughs> the government. <laughs> so I work for the government. That's for right. The you know? <laughs> and then from there, I said, hey, you know, I want to have the freedom to actually do real work. Like, get my hands dirty. Go back to my roots. And that's what I did. I created Winros Vision. So, and I saw the clients going through the same the small businesses to the same stages of change that my parents went through. And yeah, that's really that's really interesting. You got to experience as a child digital transformation, but we didn't call yes. it digital transformation back then. And your parents adjusted, I thought it was brilliant. They adjusted in the first wave. Um, from manual to electric typewriters. But when the next wave came, they couldn't adjust anymore. It was too, the barriers were too high, a cost yes. or change, whatever it was. So you got to experience that as a kid and now you've used that in your whole life. That That's a pretty, that's a pretty cool story, uh, Madeline. Thank I, you. I have to admit, that's that's pretty cool. Um, so, Madeline, let's talk a little bit about with your background and uh, all that and your focus on change and digital transformation. Mm -hmm. What do you find in organizations? What are some of the biggest barriers that people run into with adopting change or how do you go about making it happen? Because all CEOs I know, right, that they're mm -hmm. in this paradigm shift of I've got to change. Everything's changing around me. I've got to do something. And I want this to happen, but I can't get my team moving or my organization is not moving. What, what do I do? Where, where do I start? Yes. Um, it is very important to see the perspectives because nowadays, everywhere you see that people are talking about the transformation and they offer you different perspectives, right? So you have to use the one that fits more how you do things not necessarily to, to what you think are your values, but to what makes sense, how you do things. And also, if um, you are ready for that change. So I think a lot of organizations, they say, yes, let's go ahead and change. But it is easy to talk about it, but when it comes to actually doing, it's a different story. It's like my friends tell me that I'm a very direct person, right? So if you ask me a question, I always say now, do you really want to know the answer? Because you may want me to be honest with you, but then once you, once I give you the answer to that, you may not take it. So we want to do that, but in reality, we may not be ready to actually change at that particular point in time. So that, that's what I mean. So in terms of perspectives, it's good to have a perspective that you feel more comfortable with and then go ahead and embrace it. So it is good to read from a variety of sources, not just one particular uh, framework, but also be exposed to different perspectives. And the ideal is that you merge all of them. So what I did with my book, that is the same framework, that's what I tried to do. So I try to combine what I see are the best factors that help the organizations to change, 
and what makes a difference. So, for example, you go to the first step that is the snapshot. So in the snapshot, everybody say, yeah, of course, I need to do my, my needs assessed and figure out what I need. Well, let me tell you what happened here in the snapshot. You need to take a like, if today you're going to do your, your change, you do it now and you start, you have to assess what you have, what you don't have. And I give you all the specific questions. I think what happened is that in that stage, that is the snapshot where you are at a particular point in time, we do not ask the right questions. Interesting, right? Because okay. we're... We, if we don't ask questions, then we then we just state what our perspective is That's without right. knowing the reality, right? Yes. No. So, and also the other part is that in my book, I have questions on how to fill out the different um, because I have templates, so it's very action oriented. So okay. That's another thing, I believe in action. I am very into and practical and action oriented. So too much process. I know it's important, but at the end, what is the end result? It's all my time wasted. You, you see what I mean? So I'm very, in that regard, very action oriented. So I think what happened in the snapshot that everybody tells you that we need to focus on our assets. And I agree, it is wonderful to focus on your assets, but guess what happened then? Then you never face the reality of your problems. So in my book, I say that you need to go ahead and focus about those areas that actually are not working well. And, and you need to go ahead and see, hey, this is not working well. Because we tend to be like, especially nowadays, um, we don't want to hurt anybody. So if we don't want to do that, then the reality is that you're not going to move forward because there are some barriers. So right. you need to be able to identify those barriers and see which of those barriers are the ones that you are going to prioritize and, and do. Gotcha. So... I, I, I like what you, <clears throat> my first reaction to this was in the snapshot phase, can I do that by myself or do I need someone external to come and help me see what I, what I can't see or I, I refuse to see? But it sounds like the questionnaires kind of tease that out for me. Is, yes. that, is that true? Yes, it is true because the book helps you to identify the areas where you actually need a, an expert so you can do it alone so that's the unique part of the book like it actually it's a tool that you can use to identify aha this is the area that i need to work on and i don't have any idea how it is and i have no expertise there right that's right because digital transformation is about expertise so there are certain areas that like programming right so there are certain areas that that is for example i know how to program in spss in SAS to do some statistical analysis but I, I just don't want a program in Python. I just don't want to go ahead and go to R plus and I don't want to, right, program, right. you know, I, I don't want to do that I'm, because I think that my skills are better suited for other things. So the point is that once you know that this is the expertise that you need, like for example, if somebody needs certain specific equipment and you need to make sure that the quiz is going to talk to your computer and the LOT, right? Um, IOT, excuse me. So then you need that specific expertise. So what happened is that we bring the consultants too early on sometimes, and then, then you never move because- they, I've they seen that before. Yeah. I, and that's a fear that I have actually, and I've expressed it several times with other organizations. A consultant that just comes in and tells you what you already know does you no good. Oh, wow. That, that that's I agree with you. So that's what happened. So I think gotcha. that people need to do the snapshot by themselves. First. And then pull in and then pull in the areas that they don't have the expertise. I love this. This is so much better because I've seen it in large corporations they, and, and um, not just large corporations, but government agencies. They'll hire a consultant to come in and tell them what what their um, subordinates already know. Yes. And they'll listen to the consultant. And all it does is cause the organization as a whole to say, we're going to drag our feet because our management doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing because they need a consultant to tell them anything to do. When we're sitting right here, you pay us to do this. So I think it's a fascinating uh, mm -hmm. um, snapshot of um, reality. Okay, after snapshot phase, all right, I've identified a bunch of 
areas that are my weaknesses. I brought in experts. I've identified things. What's the, what do I do next? So, but remember, you know, now the areas that you need to work on. <clears throat> right. And now when the envision part, that is the, the E, I know it. Okay. So in the E, in the envision, you really have to go back now to, these are my areas. And then you say, okay, so start filling out what were your goals, objectives, everything you have from the past and see if actually, because you have to prioritize the barriers, but you not, you have to look in, in conjunction to what were your initial goals, objectives, and all of that, and the purpose of your organization. Because what happened is that when you see the snapshot, believe me, at the end of that, you are going to have the aha moment in which you say, oh, do I continue with my business? Do I close my business? Do I change my career? Do I do oh, wow, those are tough. Yeah. Those are tough things to answer. That's right. So then you are ready to say, okay, yes, I'm ready to continue. And or you can say, no, I'm not ready to continue. So probably what I need is to identify maybe somebody who can help me because I maybe want to sell the business or may want to do that. You see, because you see your the areas that you really need to work on. And you may say, there is no way. I don't have the energy or the money. Even all the laws are not going to be able to help me with this. It's being realistic. And I think, and, and you have, it helps you to be realistic. So then in the ambition, you have to go back to, if you wanted to pursue that, you want to continue, uh, improve your business and being adaptable, then you start developing again, your mission, your vision, all of that. So, so really you're talking fundamental, this is really fundamental change because you're talking about changing your vision or mission of yes, your so organization of yourself, possibly, right? Possibly, or, I possibly. The majority okay, possibly. of people that I work with, they don't change that, but they go and review, but what they do, they do what is called the impact statement. Okay. Uh, so the, I've heard of impact statements. I've used yeah. those before. So yeah. the impact statement helps, and then you go and revise the goals. Because definitely the goals, but maybe your goals that you have were not quantifiable. So we walk to the steps of actually having quantifiable uh, quantifiable goals that you can measure. And if it's a business, of course, you how you're going to attract the progress that you make. Right. And so I think that's where we miss the point in the year of transformation. So one is that, okay, we, we don't have the, I would say we are not clear about the impact that we want and our impact keeps changing and changing. So I, I want to give you an example. I think there is a, a company that makes socks or shoes and then they use the money of the socks or the shoes to help other people, right? Right. Okay. But they, they make shoes and they make um, so, so my, my point is that, and then they contribute with that. So in that case, what they produce and all the impact that they want is tied together to the products. But what if you do not make any shoes or any socks and want to do an impact? So then you have to find that kind of impact that everybody's telling you about, but it has to be incorporated into your organization. So you say you care about the environment, you do have to incorporate it into your organization. Otherwise, you're going to keep changing and changing and, and trying to adapt to whatever. You see, so it has to be congruence. So over there in the in the envision step, you go through the whole process of your goals and, and also you have to see how you integrate, how you integrate the digital uh, technology because remember, you identify the barriers, right? I identify okay. that, uh, for example, you identify that um, your bread that you make um, it takes too long because there are problems with the oven. So that means that you may need a new oven, but not just a new oven. You want an oven that is going to be talking to your computer, that is going to be connected with these others. That is, so you see, so you start looking at the connections. So you do a very good assessment of your processes. So the, the fundamental thing in the book is that without processes, you are nothing. I, I, I agree with you there, right? I've seen several organizations that, They'll throw technology at a problem, but their process is broken and they don't change their process to adopt the new technology. They just put a bandaid over it and it, it's a, it makes it worse in, in many cases. So I've, I've seen that time again. So in the envision state, in the envision phase, have you ever had organizations that have changed their goals there? Um, and that's why they're in the situation they're in. I, 
we go back to, I, I went to business school as well. Mm -hmm. So we always talk about the buggy whip company and oh. right. The buggy whip, you can make the best buggy whips in the world, but when the cars came, it destroyed the buggy whip, whip industry. Yes. I still make the best buggy whips in the world, but what, what was my goal to make the best buggy whips in the world? That's too limiting, right? That's Almost right. like your parents, yes. right? Your parents with the vocational school, right? They, they couldn't catch the next wave. Yes. Right? They, they couldn't could. adjust to it, right? That's right. And what I've seen is that you do have to integrate. So then you have your, what is called your transformation goals that are linked to your business goals. So they have uh, to link. They have to, they have to mesh. Yeah. That makes sense. And you cannot just bring, for example, nowadays people say, okay, everybody's using generative AI. So let's go ahead and do it. So no, That's right. <laughs> you have to be able to see, first of all, where in your process, you're going to be able to incorporate it and it's going to give you the best return. So that's, that's what people are missing. First of all, you go back, you have to analyze your process and see what is missing in those processes and how you can be um, better. So I feel that we are just going through this, um, for example, um, we, we, it's like like an outfit, right? So there is fashion, like in women, right? So we buy this dress, we buy this purse, and it's just a fashion, it's a fad. It, okay, do you have? Don't they say that you have to have a, a key pieces? Okay, uh, yeah, right. So it's the same thing when you're talking about in your business. You really have to look at what you have, and you have to say, if I invest in new oven, yes, it's gonna cost this, but I'll be able to reduce. Uh, my, my my cost, yeah. Your you know? cost, yeah. Your production time, all that. Yeah, there's all lots of, of things. So that's right. the part that I think we're missing. We just say, hey, I need to go ahead and buy Salesforce. I need to go ahead and buy a new system. I need to go ahead and buy. But actually, do you actually use all the tools that you had bought? No. No. <laughs> no. Well, we, yes, I like Not that. at all. Yeah, <laughs> don't say that we use probably 20% or 10% of Microsoft tools in, when we can do a lot of things, you know? So well, it, it's because it's because executives read it in CIO magazine and they go, oh yeah, everyone's moving this direction. Yeah. That's what, you know, and, uh, executives do it too. They follow, yeah. they follow the crowd, right? Oh, I better do that or I'll fall behind. Mm -hmm. So, right. hey, let's move on to the A part of SEAM. Okay, so the A is the one that I like the most because in order for you to move forward, you do have to have written, written things. It, it, I always tell to my staff and I always tell everybody, if it's not written, it doesn't exist. Oh, I like so, that. So you do have to have a plan that is written. I, I mean, if it's in the computer, of course, I do advocate everything is on, on an online tool. And it's action plan, not a word plan. An action plan will tell you specifically, you're going to do this, this, this. This person is going to do this, this. Uh, and see, so it's very detailed. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to be written that you're never going to change. No. Actually, you can modify and change as you learn. And you have these special meetings that actually the military uses that is very effective where you actually, you know, I give you the steps there so that when you have meetings, those meetings are not just like to say yes and you're bored to death. No, you're actually engaged. That's a lot of meetings. Yes. So the action plan helps you to monitor and then you will realize, because I use in the book the example of Mora. So the, then you're going to see how she transforms and how she has to adjust and change. So I show how her plan has been changing. And and that is the um, the beauty of it. Later on, I'd like to talk a little bit about the example. So anyway, once you have the plan, of course, now it comes the most important part, right? the major. And the major goes back, like, if you already had this infrastructure in the snapshot, in the vision, and in the act, now it's easy for the major. I have, to, I have to have a way of measuring that I'm successful, right? Otherwise. And then you already have all the foundation. So it yeah. just helps you to put it together and say, okay, now I can go ahead and keep moving. Why? Because remember that 
when everybody tells you, you have to have an agile organization, you have to have this, adaptable, whatever, what does that mean? So with this approach, you know what it means because you already have all these steps. So what we are missing is a systematic approach to actually do the things because everybody focuses too much on the mentality and change. I can go to a thousand seminars and just tire all the seminars. What do you do when you go back to your office? What do you do? Do you actually? <clears throat> no, there, yeah. The emotion. So we go to these emotions and to this um, revival. So, like, oh my God, yes, I'm empowered. I, but go back and tell me what was the last conference that you went? And when you went back, you actually implemented a. You actually did something? Yeah. So, you see what I mean? So, the framework pushes you that you do have to do something. I, I, really, I really like this approach. I like what you said about that because I've been to a lot of conferences. And I'm like energized afterwards. And you're right. This happens all the time. Um, and it sounds like it's very systemic the way that, that I can walk through this change. You also mentioned, though, that your action plan changes um, as you're going through it because you're going to find things that you don't. So it's not like I spend three months developing my action plan and then go and do it. You, yeah. you, you're talking about, I, I write some things down and then I walk through it and then I add more to my action plan. But the envision part is guiding me. That's um, right. Yes. And it's I got you. it. I, I got it. That makes yes. sense. And so I will talk about, in my book, <clears throat> I talk about Mora, that is the character. And the reader will go through these steps with Mora. So they will identify okay. themselves with her. So, but there is one part that I haven't mentioned in other places, but I, I like to mention here. So Mora has this bread and she sells to the chains uh, that there are uh, national, national change, right? So guess what happened? If she wants to incorporate uh, artificial intelligence and to be able to, to know who's going to be her target. So this is what happened. She, this is the crucial part because I talk about the marketing part. So in the book, I specifically explain that she partners with the chain because the chain already has all the information about her customers. So then she can have a better strategy by partnering with that chain and be able to use that information to target new clients. Very different approach that she that sells B2B that so sells for this to this company, that she decides, oh, I need to have my all AI team. I all my own. Yeah, yeah. And go because I want to sell more artisanal bread. So that is what I'm talking about. Like, and also that type, like the the comp the uh, markets for what she's selling her her bread have all the information about the preference, how many times they buy the bread, everything. Wow. So, so, and they can help her to develop her profile so, so, of the target. So why build that yourself when if you partner with someone, you get that information and that's that win-win, you know, Covey always talked yes. about win-win things. This is most definitely an augmentation of that, right? Because you're yes. saying um, in your snapshot, you've identified that as a weakness of mine. Where yes. can I go find that do I need to develop it myself or can I partner with someone? I, I like that strategy. That's a very good strategy. And the other part of the book that um, I focus a lot is that everybody focus on the marketing and the sales. So I think in that regard, I go back to the quality of your product. That's what I emphasize. You have to look at your processes and see how you're developing your product. I think the, the missing piece is that in the effort to, to follow what everyone is doing, we forget the quality. And quality to me is at the core of any organization. I think eventually that's going to be the what is going to define um, who is the winner and who is not. Because I feel that the quality has decreased. So there are companies that are excellent, but if they continue making these mistakes um, in terms of the quality of the product, I don't think it's going to be sustainable. So, you, you know, I, I used to think that too, but I've seen a shift and maybe it's shifting back 
Um, especially around like cloud services, cloud service providers uptime is horrendous. I, I was a CIO. And if I had downtime as much as Amazon or Azure or Google has, I'd be fired. Um, but they still seem to continue to, to go on, um, even with, you know, only like 98% uptime. Um, I had to have three nines at least, and I was aiming for four nines uptime. So I agree with you. I think quality has decreased dramatically over the last two decades. Because um, it has and, to touch you. It has to touch you personally. And, yeah. But I, I think something that is going on is that the fact that many times we are not willing to, sometimes we're sacrificing that because we don't want the, I don't know, the confrontation. We don't want, so you see, so it's, I think we're going to a transformation in, in every single place, right? So, but we all know that everybody has a, it's not like it's going to be forever. So eventually I feel that the thing has to change because if you continues, continues on the pattern, um, at the same time, you have people who are very discontent and they speak up. So I feel that this is the time of, of, of change. We have to just go ahead and embrace it and be adaptable. But at the end of the day, I think it goes back to the quality for sustainability purpose. Versus, I, I like that. Sustainability purposes, long-term, people will buy quality. Yes, regardless. Right. Yeah. And uh, so that's what that I say that is important about your impact. Because if you're really, if your organization goes, uh, really cares about something, you are really going to have some goals that align with that. If you want to reduce emissions, I mean, at the end of the day, it goes back to if you really care about that or you don't and their actions. So that's what I think is challenging for organizations to change because here is your values and this is what you do. So that's the misalignment and uh, that, that creates the confusion with the employees that eventually say, why should I change if at the end of the day I go back to work and it's the same thing? It's the same thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Hey, Madeline, we're already at the top of, at the end of this episode, this has been wonderful. If people want to find out more, um, you've got your book, it's available on Amazon, um, Seam. Yes. Um, and if they want to find out more, you have a website that they can go yes. to? Yes, it's, it's my name, Madeline Wallace. Yeah, uh, madelinewallace.com. And then they can communicate with me via the uh, website. And yeah, it is it's become an Amazon bestseller. So I'm very happy. In Congratulations on that. I know that's a, a it's it's nice to see your own child because I've I've written three books myself. So I know the first time you get it in hand, it's like it's real, right? And that it's doing well. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some insights and also learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and embrace the digital revolution.